This video covers exchange rate policy and the central bank. As you can tell from the title of this chapter and this video, exchange rate policy is closely linked with central banking. I'll start off and motivate this video with three examples on how various central banks around the world intervened in their currency markets to reduce the impact of a financial crisis. Then I'll get into what an exchange rate policy means and why countries manipulate their currency, in other words, move the value of their currency relative to another country's currency. The two most important reasons for countries manipulating their currency is one, to either fix their currency relative to another country to foster trade with the other country, you know, so it eliminates exchange rate risk and that motivates trade. And the other reason is they manipulate their currency to offset the effects of a financial crisis. The first crisis I cover starts off with the tequila crisis of 1994, but let's rewind before that. Go back six years before that. In 1988, Mexico fixed its exchange rate to the U.S. dollar. So that's, a, that's an example of an exchange rate policy, to fix its exchange rate, go from floating to fixing the rate. Okay, so it fixed its, you know, why did it do that? Well, it, it wanted to uh, promote economic activity, trade with the U.S., and capital mobility into the country. And, you know, it would be great to have, have uh, American car manufacturers, for example, invest in Mexico. Then it would help with jobs and so on and so forth. So that was, that was the goal. Uh, fast forward now, go forward to 1994. And in 1994, there was a lot of political turmoil going on in, in Mexico. And then NAFTA came about, and so there was a lot of investment, a lot of money came into Mexico pretty quickly because of NAFTA, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement that was signed. When this political uncertainty came about, it caused all that money that had, that had come in quickly to exit extremely quickly. And so Mexico's central bank ran into a problem because when you fix an exchange rate, somebody has to keep that exchange rate fixed, and it's usually a central bank that does that. And there was pressure on the central bank. It couldn't stop all the capital outflows. It couldn't stop the, its exchange rate from, from devaluing, dropping. In other words, the value of its currency dropping. So what Mexico had to do was devalue its currency. And it had told the, the investing world just before that, that it was not going to devalue. It had the strength to keep that exchange rate fixed with the U.S., but that wasn't the case. They very quickly, after that, devalued the currency, and money exited the country faster than it went in. And what happened was real wages fell by about 30%. GDP fell 6%. Inflation rose 50%. So the, one of the reasons why Mexico fixed the exchange rate in the first place was to imp import the monetary policy of the U.S. And we'll explain what that means in this video. But ba basically, in 1988, Mexico had a very high inflation rate, like around 100% or more. Well, shortly after adopting the fixed exchange rate and importing U.S.'s monetary policy, inflation fell to a very reasonable amount. Okay? But then everything unwound with the political turmoil, NAFTA bringing money in, and then money leaving as fast as it came uh, in faster and just leaving a vacuum in its wake. It's kind of like a tornado hit the country economically. So there's interesting concepts in there that, that come out in this video. Let me give you another case. In 1997, crony capitalism led to the misallocation of uh, of capital across Thailand causing extensive defaults and skyrocketing interest rates. So the government had a hand in how where money was lent throughout the economy. And it wasn't lent to the best places, and so there was heavy defaults. And interest rates started to skyrocket because there was high risk premiums, people were afraid to lend. The Thai government was unable to maintain the peg to the U.S. dollar. Capital flight, in other words, money just exited the, the country pretty quickly. The crisis spread to Southeast Asia and Japan, and the term Asian contagion was coined by the media. Asian stock markets collapsed and banks withdrew. Long-term capital management, called LTCM, was a highly leveraged U.S. international hedge fund based in the U.S., 
but it invested internationally, began losing money. And around the same time, Russia, in part because of the Thailand crisis, and around the same time, Russia defaulted on its debt and it devalued its currency in 1998. All of this ultimately caused long-term capital management to collapse and go into bankruptcy and in turn almost caused the, the world's economy to collapse. Now, before I come to the third example of exchange rate turmoil, let me take a quick sidebar to fill you in on how, on how the Asian financial crisis of 1997 caused long-term capital management to collapse. First, let me say that long-term capital took on many financial bets that were complex and they were highly leveraged. Each position by itself, arbitrage position, for example, could return 1%, but when they're leveraged 30 to 1, it means the results are magnified, so the returns are magnified, and so are the risk. A 30 to 1 bet basically means you're controlling $30 worth of assets on the left-hand side of the balance sheet with $1 in equity on the right-hand side, which means you got $29 in debt, if you look at it from that perspective. That said, long-term capital management had bets that ultimately depended on the value of Russian debt, and the value of the Russian currency. But in 1997, the Asian crisis caused a recession in Asia, which caused demand for oil to drop. Well, oil is a major export for Russia, which before the crisis was in bad financial shape to begin with. So Russia's exports dried up, the government couldn't pay off its debt, and defaulted. At the, around the same time, Russia devalued its currency because it couldn't support it. And you'll know what I mean by this, by the end of the video. Both the devaluation and the default caused a massive world shift or a flight to safety and long-term capital management quickly collapsed. Now, let me move to the third example of an exchange rate disturbance to motivate this video. In September of 2000, a coordinated central bank intervention led to the Fed ECB, that's the European Central Bank, the BOC, the Bank of Canada, and the BOE, the Bank of England, and the Bank of Japan, which is the BOJ, to purchase about 6 billion euros to stop the depreciation. So it's coordinated intervention by a number of central banks. They bought up 6 billion euros to prevent that depreciation. The euro immediately appreciated by 6%, as you would expect it to go up with that heavy demand. But the gains were erased by mid-October. A month later, they were erased. So the question becomes, why, with all this effort, why was the appreciation so quickly erased? Why did it disappear? Those are interesting questions. So what we want to do in this video is cover the concept of, what, well, what exactly is an exchange rate policy? You know, countries have exchange rate policies. What are they? Why do some countries fix their currency to an anchor, such as the U.S. dollar? And, and it's not just dollars or dollarization. It could be to anchoring your currency to the euro or euroization. And why does stability policy, which is what an exchange rate policy often does, fixed exchange rates, uh, why does this stabilization policy sometimes actually lead to instability? And how do we make sense of all these events that I just talked about? I'll talk about even more throughout the video. What else will we cover in this video? Well, we'll do some review. To start off, we'll talk about exchange rates and inflation. And uh, we'll recall PPP, purchasing power parity, which is a long-run relationship between exchange rates and inflation. Then we'll look at exchange rates and interest rates, which are a short-term phenomena through the concept of interest rate parity. Then we'll move on to the trilemma problem, which I think you'll find interesting. Uh, we'll cover the mechanics of maintaining fixed exchange rates, including sterilization. And towards the end of this video, we'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of fixed exchange rates. We'll look at methods and strategies for keeping exchange rates fixed. We'll look at pegs, meaning fixed exchange rates. Sometimes they're hard uh, fixed exchange rates where it's, there's very little leeway. The exchange rate is, is, is kept rigid. And other times there's what's called soft pegs, which allow for some flexibility in the exchange rate. We'll look at currency boards and dollarization and unofficial and official dollarization. There's differences, and we'll discuss that. We'll talk a little bit about central bank liquidity currency swaps, which were initiated, I shouldn't say initiated in 2020. They've been around for a while, but they're now being discussed more. In, in today's world. 
and you can skip the appendix at the end of the chapter on the balance of payments. So what is exchange rate policy? It's a policy instituted by the government of a country to keep its exchange rate fixed. Now, fixed is sometimes called peg. It's the peg of currency to another currency. And the peg could be a hard peg, or it could be a soft peg. A hard peg would mean you'd keep the exchange rate constant at 7.8 yuan to the dollar. As a recent example with China, and you wouldn't let it deviate at all. Yeah, that would be hard. And not only would it be a hard peg, it would actually be kind of hard to do because there's always going to be some wiggle room that's going to be allowed. And the question is, well, how much wiggle room is there allowed? And so the more wiggle room you allow, the more you lean towards what's called a soft peg. And sometimes soft pegs will be called tunnel or snakes. And so the exchange rate can do this over time within boundaries, an upper and lower boundary. So the exchange rate policy, they're implemented to stabilize exchange rates because you can narrow this substantially. And when you narrow that substantially, you get rid of exchange rate risk. And exchange rate risk has two major problems. One, investment is not going to flow into your country from outside unless you have a stable exchange rate because Money will come in, and then when people want to withdraw their money, there's going to be a huge exchange exchange rate loss because the currency depreciated. Well, that's that's a problem, and so countries want to keep their exchange rates to be able to entice capital into the country. And the other reason is for importing and exporting purposes, but mainly for ex exporting purposes to keep a stable exchange rate, so that um, people you know the, the price of the goods that are being exported. By this country, by the particular country, and it's going to be imported by other countries. That price is relatively stable. The last thing you want to do is have very volatile prices because of exchange rates, and other countries just aren't going to want to do business with you. So that's the motive, and that's the background on why countries have exchange rate policies. And we'll go further into it as the video goes on. Now let's move on to a quick review of what we covered in a previous chapter on exchange rates. Let's look at inflation and exchange rates. Remember, we abbreviated exchange rates as E, as e and it's the number of foreign currency to a dollar. Okay, usually there's a one right there, which is not written. Okay, and so the first thing we looked at was in, in that chat, one of the first things we looked at in the previous chapter was purchasing power parity. Which we said was a long run relation, a long run relationship between inflation and price levels and the exchange rate. And graphically, what that meant was you could have the CPIs, the relative consumer price indexes of two countries. Let's say it's the dollar, the CPI for our, uh, for the United States, which is based in dollars, and then the CPI in the UK, which is pound based. And if you look at that over time, the, you know, the relative inflation rates, they change over time, but not that dramatically. Now, if you were to graph exchange rates over that, then what you'd see is something like this. And so you'd see that there'd be short run deviations from the long run trend, so to speak, which is driven by relative inflation. And we can remember that concept by looking at the idea that if we had the CPI in dollars, which is a basket of goods measured in dollar prices, and we multiplied that by pounds to the dollar, and so remember, effectively, the dollar sign cancels out conceptually, and then you're left with a price of the consumer basket in pounds. And so that, that was the concept of purchasing power parity, which says, the price of a basket of goods in one country, once you adjust for exchange rates, should equal the price of the same basket in another country. Now, we can mathematically flip this around a little bit and, and put this into percent changes. Okay, so flip this over into percent changes and we have the percentage change in a CPI measured in dollars. It's 
That's basically the inflation rate in our country, in the US, right? The percentage change in the CPI is the inflation rate. And we could say we can operationalize this by also looking at this as being a percentage change in the exchange rate. So that's how much the exchange rate goes up or down on a percentage basis, and that's going to equal the percentage change in the consumer index in, in pounds in the UK, and that's the inflation rate in England. And so this will be helpful knowing this concept, so keep this concept tucked away for a little bit, for a few minutes from now. Now, what we also want to include and discuss is interest rates. and exchange rates. And we said in previous chapters that this was a short run concept and it's covered in the concept of interest rate parity. And interest rate parity went something like this. We take a dollar and if we invest it in the US for one year, we would get this return. So you take a dollar, you invest it, if it's uh, R is 10.10, then you'll end up with a dollar 10 in one year. That should equal, assuming that there's arbitrage uh, arbitragers out there who want to equalize this, because what's going to happen is, you know, mo money's going to flow into the country with the highest return. And when money flows into the country with the higher return, those returns are going to come back down. And the returns in the country that money left are going to go up. So there's going to be an equalization so that the return that you earn in one country should equal the return that you get in another country. And what's that return going to look like? Well, if you take a dollar, right, and you multiply it by the exchange rate, say pounds per dollar, right, this is, this is E, then this is how many, how many pounds you're going to have, because the dollars will cancel out, you'll be left with pounds, that's how many pounds, so you're going to convert your money, your one dollar into so many pounds, e pounds. Then you're going to invest it at the interest rate in England for one period. Okay, so you don't really need the one there, but we'll put it in anyway. And so you'll get this interest rate, whatever that may be, which could be different from the dollar interest rate. And then at the end of one year, you're going to have to flip this over back in the dollar. So right now, this is in pounds, okay? Because this is pounds, this is in pounds. And so what we need to do is we need to take this and multiply it by the dollar to the pound exchange rate, which is just basically one over E, to convert this whole thing. So this whole thing is in pounds right here, this whole thing right here. And this is pounds on the bottom, so the pounds kind of cancel out. You're back the dollars, the dollars. So this side is dollars. This side, ultimately, with all this math, is dollars. And that should equalize. Otherwise, money, like I said, money's going to flow into the country with the higher return. And when you put money in a country with the higher return, it brings down that country's return. And the money with that left a particular country will end up raising the return in the country where it left. And so that's what this interest rate parity is about. This can happen quite quickly, which is why this is a short run mechanism. So if we summarize the math, the, the dollars, you know, $1 doesn't change anything, get rid of these, one doesn't do anything. And so we take one plus the interest rate in dollars in the US divided by one plus the R for the interest rate in the UK, and that's going to equal E divided by E to the E. This is actually, right here, is we're looking at an expected exchange rate. So you're, you're looking to invest at time, time zero, and we're looking to a one-year horizon. We're making this initial investment right here, time zero, and then we're trying to figure out, well, what, you know, for this to equal, what must the exchange rate be in one year from now, that's the expected exchange rate. Okay. So this relationship holds. It says basically, that's basically the, the, the relative difference between interest rates in one country to the next. Okay. And then this is the change in the exchange rate, the expected change in the exchange rate. You could put this into
you know, change form. So you got the change in this relationship between interest rates would equal the change in the exchange rate. So why am I telling you this? Well, if you fix exchange rates, this percentage change will be zero. Exchange rates won't change because you're fixing or pegging the exchange rate from one currency to the next. This will be zero. So any changes here will be zero. And then the change in relative interest rates will also be zero. If you're fixing the exchange rates here, you're going to fix the exchange rates and the interest rates. You're the relative exchange rates are not going to change under a fixed rate regime. Now, if we go to purchasing power parity, look what happens. This goes to zero. There is no change in the exchange rate. So what you have is the inflation rate in one country will match the inflation rate in the other country when you have fixed exchange rates. Okay? Inflation rates will match up. And then you basically have relative changes in interest rates are unchanged under fixed exchange rates. Now let's move to the trilemma problem. Let me motivate the trilemma problem this way. Suppose you're a country, small country, and you're, there's countries around you, for example, you're in this small country, and, you know, as a small country and you're not doing, let's say you're not doing too well, what you want is you want, you want capital, capital now, inflows to come in. And you want capital inflows, meaning you want other, you know, foreign, foreign countries to invest in, in your country. So you're just a small country and, you know, you, you'd, lo you'd love to have a car manufacturer come in and put up a gigantic facility. So you put your workers to your, your population to work, you probably would get good wages out of it. And so capital inflows can do a country really good. Now, if you have capital inflows, you're going to need capital outflows because, for example, they're going to make an investment. They'll Maybe they'll set up companies in this country. They're going to want to send dividends out, for example. They want to maybe sh you know, de-invest at times and so money needs to flow back and forth and the country small country is going to say yeah you know that's a good thing most economists would say that you know the other thing is you want to make this as a friendly environment as possible and so what you also want to do is you probably want to fix the exchange rate with your primary uh, you know the, the the countries that you primarily deal with the most in business and the trade of goods so this is capital flows and then we want to fix the exchange rate for goods and services so in, so we can export uh, and keep prices stable and there would be no exchange rate risk associated with that right then that makes sense and not only would fixed exchange rates make sense for goods and services for both imports and exports, would it make sense? But it also would keep, you know, the risk associated with capital inflows and outflows at a minimum because there would be no exchange rate gains or losses associated with that. So that makes sense. Then the, the third thing that if you're a country like this, a small country, is, hey, you know, you want to stabilize your economy. And be able to stabilize it means you need a monetary policy to do that, which means you need to use are interest rates to you know to increase or decrease to keep your economy relatively stable over time and growing the problem with these three scenarios is there it's impossible to have all three situations at the same time now you could you you and i should say that i should be careful here when i say that you can't have all three of these with a hard peg and you can't have all three of these in the long run. In the short run, you can do all sorts of things and the pressures won't build up. But if you try to do this in the long run, it's, going to, it's just not gonna work. It's gonna cause problems. And that's what the trilemma concept is all about. The trilemma problem is you can't have everything. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can have two of these, but not a third. So pick any two and you can't have the third. So if you look at various countries, we'll see various combinations at play across the world. So let's look at Switzerland first. 
Okay. Uh, let's look at capital mobility here. Let's look at monetary policy here, and then fixed E here. Now, Switzerland has capital mobility. It has no monetary policy because it has fixed its exchange rate to the euro. So the monetary policy is set by the ECB for Switzerland. Now, how does that work exactly? Well, let's look at it in terms of interest rate parity. So uh, let's see, Swiss franc. Hey, here's interest rate parity. And since the Swiss bank, the Swiss national bank, I should say, is keeping this fixed, so the change here is zero, which means this side has to have a zero change. It's not, it doesn't mean this fraction is going to be zero. It just means the change will be zero. And what happens is this country is, is importing Europe's monetary policy. So the way that works is, look, if interest rates in, the, in Europe go up under the euro, this, this R goes up, then this R must go up. So let's say um, R equals RSF, Swiss franc, let's say interest rates are 10%, and, oops, and R in Europe is 5%. So that means the difference between the two is 5%. So if this goes up to 12 and this goes up to 7, then you're going to maintain this 5%. And so this fraction is not changing. Okay. Now, how is that working? Why is that happening? The country has flexible capital mobility. Mobility, money can move in and out of the, the country easily. Remember, that's the underlying foundation the interest rate parity conditions, that there's arbitrage at work. Countries can, you can move money into a country with a higher interest rate compared to a country with a lower interest rate or vice versa. Now, let's look at China as an example. Now, you know, you got to go rewind to what I just said a little earlier. I had motivated the trilemma problem with a small country, but it's instructed to even look at larger countries and see how they match up to this trilemma problem. In China, they have no capital mobility, and that's a stretch, by the way. Um, it, it's kind of misleading, I think, in the text and, and other discussions. Keep in mind that there is a continuum of mobility out there. So you can have zero mobility, and I, don't know, I guess maybe 100% would be one way to describe it. So here you have no capital mobility, and then here you have full capital mobility with no restrictions is what I'm trying to say. And there's a continuum. No, Very few countries are right exactly on this line here at, at total zero. It's just that when you start moving in this direction, capital mobility gets hung up pretty quickly. And so we're going to say China has no capital mobility, and there are restrictions on how, whether or not money can go into or out of China. Now, they have a monetary policy in China. We've looked at that a little bit before. And yes, they do have a fixed exchange rate. It's fixed to the dollar. So the trilemma problem is satisfied here. So now the question is, wait a second, if this is fixed to the dollar here, why isn't this the FOMC controlling their monetary policy? Well, let's go to interest rate parity. Okay. Yeah, and what do we see? Well, first thing we've got to see is that this doesn't even apply because there's no capital mobility. With no capital mobility, interest rate parity doesn't work. There's no arbitrage conditions to allow this to work. Okay. Now, you could also look at Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is, is pretty similar in, in this context to Switzerland because Hong Kong, it's, it's not a country, but it's a region, a special region, is they have capital mobility in Hong Kong, unlike China, and they do have fixed exchange rates to the dollar. Uh, but their monetary policy is set by the FOMC. They have no monetary policy of their own. Now, we could go even bigger, look at the U.S., and yes, it has a flexible mobility, or money can move in and out. 
obviously we have monetary policy, it's most of the course, and then exchange rates are not fixed. So the U.S. and all these other countries are behaving in a manner that's consistent with the trilemma problem. Okay. Now let's go one step further here, one step further. Let's look at the state of Maine for just for the sake of it here. Now the state of Maine, uh, you can, as we'll see a little later on, think of the, the Maine as being like a, a, it's a state or think of it as a country that has totally dollarized. In other words, it's totally, it uses 100% of its currency and all its transactions are in dollars. And so it does have, you know, when you have dollars and all the other states around you have dollars, the capital flows pretty easily. It has, yes, it has a fixed exchange rate because essentially the dollar is the dollar, so there is no exchange rate risk there. There's no, no change from that perspective. And no, the state of Maine does not have a monetary policy. It's set by the FOMC. FMOC sets Maine's monetary policy. So you can see that that makes, you know, that makes it so much easier to, to go across the country when you can take your dollars and money can be invested in and out of the state easily. You can, you know, just jump in your car and quite easily with money in your pocket go anywhere you want. And you don't have to worry about exchange, uh, changing, changing currencies in any form. It's just that our monetary policy has been given up to the Federal Reserve. At the opening of this video, I mentioned the year 2000 Euro intervention. That's when the Fed and several other central banks around the world bought up euros to prop up the currency. It's not hard to see why they did that. The value of the euro dropped significantly, and people were concerned that problems of Europe would spread to the rest of the world and destabilize the world's economy. Let's use the events surrounding this foreign currency intervention to better understand how the Fed actually intervenes in the currency markets, the effects on monetary policy, and how it stabilizes the economy. So let's analyze a foreign currency intervention by the Fed in a manner that we're familiar with. So let's look at the Fed's balance sheet. Start off that way. So here we have the Fed's balance sheet. And in the example that we're looking at, the Fed bought euros. And that's going to increase euros. And so here we have foreign currency euros. Now let's just use the typical $100 that we're used to seeing. And so the Fed buys this, buy these euros. It goes into an account. And the question is now, how does the Fed pay for it? Well, it's going to issue reserves because it's about going to buy this from a commercial bank. And it's going to debit the reserves of that commercial bank. And that's going to trigger M, little m. The, the money supply is going to increase and the multiplier, little m, is going to work its way through the economy and you're going to have an increase in the money supply. Before we go any further, the Fed doesn't want to hold just foreign currency in a bank account. It's going to want to earn interest on that. So it's going to take this $100 and it's going to buy a bond. And it'll usually buy a government bond. Well, what's the biggest government in Europe? Well, Germany. So the, they ended up buying a G German bond, well, bonds probably. They bought German bonds for 100. And so what you see here is you see a couple of things that you need to be aware of. One is this looks a lot like an open market operation where the Fed purchased a security. But instead of buying treasuries, it ended up holding a, a German government bond and issued reserves. But right here, this transaction, this side of the transaction, just changed the Fed's monetary policy. The money supply went up through the multiplier process, a little m, and interest rates had to have come down a bit. So the Fed intervened in the euro market and ends up changing U.S. monetary policy. Now, before we go any further, let me pause the analysis on this specific transaction and explain some terminology. On the left, I either had foreign currency in euros or a German bond. They're foreign assets. Foreign assets, whether they're denominated in foreign currency in a bank account or in terms of a foreign bond, are labeled international reserves. International reserves are always on the left-hand side of a central bank's balance sheet, and domestic reserves are on the right-hand side. Now let's continue analyzing this specific transaction. 
you can look at it from a supply and demand diagram if it helps. So here we have E and we're going to look at the price of a dollar in terms of the euro. And we're going to look at dollars here. Now, notice carefully, I'm using dollars here. I'm looking at the quantity of dollars and the price of a dollar in terms of euros. I'm talking about euros, so you, you would and you might want to model this in terms of euros, the quantity of euros here and the price of a euro, so flip this exchange rate around. But since I want to look at the American side of things, I'll analyze it this way. And we have the supply and demand. Well, it's demand for dollars, and we have supply oops, for dollars here. And what happened was the Fed increased the supply of dollars, so the supply curve shift out, and what do you have? A drop in the exchange rate, which should be fairly apparent. Now, let's model it and see what the effects are for the U.S. in terms of interest rate parity. So we see that E came down, and we know that interest rates are going to come down. So it looks like things are balancing out, and that makes sense for now. For now, we're okay. We're on safe ground. Things work out overall. Now, before we go further, let's label this transaction right here as an unsterilized transaction. And what I mean by that is, it's unsterilized because the Fed changed its monetary policy and this worked its way through the economy. All these reserves have worked their way through the economy or will work their way through the economy. And so we haven't negated this effect. But the Fed does not want to change its monetary policy. And in 2000, when it intervened in the euro, it ended up reversing this effect on monetary policy because the Fed didn't want to change monetary policy just because it was intervening in the euro. So it implemented another transaction. And the transaction that I'm going to look at, this additional transaction here, is called a sterilizing transaction. So the sterilizing transaction means we got to get rid of reserves by $100 because this was an increase in reserves, money going into the economy. Now we need to pull it out. So that now there's no effect on the monetary base here. So this is a sterilizing transaction. Now be careful because some, some books and some economists will refer to this entire process as a sterilized, a sterilized foreign currency intervention or a sterilized transaction. But it's made up of two pieces. First there's the unsterilized component and then there's the sterilized effect. And what's the sterilized, what's the other side of the sterilized effect? Well, the Fed would have to sell a treasury bond, for example, of $100 to get rid of those reserves. And so ultimately what you see is sometimes referred to as on this side of the balance sheet, what we've done is we, we've swapped a treasury bond and gotten and received a German bond in its place. That's sometimes called a portfolio effect because we've just demanded and uh, and we increased our demand for, and the increase in demand for German bonds relative to U.S. bonds. That's sometimes called a portfolio effect, just as a side note. But the important part is, with the sterilizing effect, this side is wiped out. There's no change in reserves. And so this effect decreased the money supply. You unwind that multiplier process, and interest rates go up. So what happens is, there's no effect on E or the interest rate. So relative interest rates stay the same once you do the sterilization. Because look, if we start with the same interest rate and end with the same interest rate, you can think of that as, look, there's no change in monetary policy. Because remember, the Fed targets interest rates and we haven't changed them. So the target's still the same and the level of interest rates are still the same. So from this lesson, this, this section of the video, one of the most important parts you can glean from this is that in order to have an effect on the exchange rate over the long run, you need to have a change in interest rates. So let's rewrite this here. You need to change that current interest rate, assuming there's no change in expected exchange rates, you know, the forward rate. 
if you change this exchange rate, you have to change the interest rate in, in the U.S. or for any particular country that you want to analyze this situation in. So the point is, had the Fed just done the unsterilized part of the transaction, what you see above my hand here, then this exchange rate would have went down, interest rates would have went down, and then we could have maintained this lower exchange rate through a lower interest rate. But as soon as you bring this interest rate back up so that there's no change in this interest rate, you're going to bring the exchange rate back up. And that's exactly what the Fed ended up doing. One side of the Fed in New York performed this intervention in the foreign currency markets, and another department, so to speak, area of the Fed in New York, did an open market operation. And they, ba they basically canceled each other out. Now, you got to keep in mind that it was more than just the U.S. intervening in the markets. So, you know, the value of the euro was pushed down a bit for a while, especially when you have a coordinated intervention. You know, that's going to disrupt the market. It's going to change the market's expectations of where exchange rates will go. So that's important to realize when you have multiple central banks all at once intervening in the market. But if they don't change their interest rates, then things are going to snap back in terms of the exchange rate. The exchange rate's going to snap back in the direction of where it came from. It may not be exactly where it came from because that signaling effect and the fact that you know there's market participants, big market participants, meaning the central banks, wanting to influence where the exchange rate goes. So now, what about purchasing power parity? How does that work into this? Well, remember, purchasing power parity is a long-run phenomena. And it says that the exchange rate equals the CPI for the euro divided by the CPI for the dollar. And so what you have here is you have a change in the exchange rate, right? It drops, the exchange rate drops, but pretty much you're not going to see immediately over the long run, you might see a, see a change, but you're not going to have a change in these relative prices. The basket of goods in the euro and the basket of goods in the U.S., the CPI, consumer price indexes, are not going to change for the most part, especially in the short run, days or weeks. So what's going to happen is it's going to be a deviation so from purchasing power parity. So what happens is we have the relative CPIs here, right? which, you know, over the long run change a little bit, but not very much. And then you're going to have choppiness around that. And that's the exchange rate moving around it. And so you're going to have a blip up or down. Well, in this case, it's going to be a blip down because the exchange rate dropped. And so that would account for just the DVA. We'd account for that with a deviation from purchasing power parity, which is what we're used to seeing. So no surprise there. So one more concept that I want to talk about in this scenario. And, and that has to do with, well, how much does E change and how much does R change on the unsterilized portion of the transaction? And so we have E changing, oh, e, e changing and R changing, but how much with an unsterilized transaction? Remember why that's happening. You know, the money supply is increasing. The supply of dollars is going up and so the price of money is coming down because money is, is much more available now. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about here. So what's the effect on the exchange rate from the change in R? It depends on how R changes. That's really what we're saying is it all depends on how R changes. Let's look at the Fed funds market here. And here we have the dollars, dollars of reserves and we have a demand curve looks something like this and we have a supply curve and we have remember the discount window here and you have the discount rate so here think about this I'm, I'm looking at the year 2000 by the way because that's when the Fed intervened in the euro market and so we basically were on this downward sloping portion of the demand for Fed funds there was no flat spot where we had interest on excess reserves because remember that didn't come about until 2008 so what happened was the Fed increased, increased the supply of reserves and interest rates fell. 
Okay, well, it really depends on the steepness of this demand curve. So how much interest rates change depends on, the, on this demand curve, and that's going to be related to how much E changes. So that's, going to, so that's going to drive how much E changes. If it was in today's world, in today's world, we have a demand curve that's flattened out, but at the interest on excess reserves line here, we have Fed funds rate, dollar for reserves, and if the supply curve is out here, and that's the supply curve, well, if you increase reserves here, and we're in a, what's called an abundant reserve regime, there's not going to be any change in interest rates. We're going to stay at this interest rate on excess reserves. So there's no change in the interest rate, and there's going to be very little change in the exchange rate, if none. You know, the way we're modeling it, there won't be any because there's no change in, in interest rates because of that. So the ultimate effect on E depends on the change in the interest rate. And the change in the interest rate depends on, are we on this downward sloping demand curve? And what's the steepness of this curve? And then the question is, well, are we in an ample reserve regime? And if we're in an ample reserve regime, there's no change in interest rates, so you're not going to have very much of a change in E. And the other thing that you want to keep in mind also is that when a central bank intervenes in the currency markets, the interesting thing is you think, okay, the Fed is really big. But in currency markets, the Fed and the central banks are not that big in those markets. So when the Fed actually intervenes in and of itself, it's a small percentage of the foreign currency transactions for the day. Uh, well, maybe for a day it may be you know, on the large side. But overall, in the scheme of things, in, say, a given week, the, the private market is, is way bigger. And so the way a central bank changes exchange rates is, again, through this interest rate, under normal conditions, you have a multiplier effect set up by this change in reserves, remember? So if the multiplier is big, the Fed can leverage that multiplier effect, change interest rates to change exchange rates. Now let's talk about advantages and disadvantages of fixed exchange rates. The advantages of fixed exchange rates, as we've talked about before, is that there's no capital gain or loss associated with making investments in, in a country. You don't have to worry about that instability. In, in terms of capital goods, your prices are not changing because of changes in exchange rates. So it makes it very conducive to, to keep a fixed exchange rate with an anchor country that you do a lot of business with, which is what Mexico had, had done in the past. Mexico fixed, fixed its exchange rate, its peso, to the U.S. dollar. Why? Because most of its activity and trading activity was with the U.S., and it wanted to facilitate that even more to its advantage by locking exchange rates. Another major advantage of fixing an exchange rate to another country is that it in, the country, again, imports its monetary policy from the anchor country. And if the smaller country has a history of high inflation, you know, think PPP, purchasing power parity, then what happens is the inflation rates will come down in that small country because it's, it's adopting the monetary policy of the anchor. And you wouldn't want to anchor to a country that has unstable inflation. That doesn't make sense. So you'd want to anchor to a, a stable currency. Now let's look at the problems associated with fixing exchange rates. The fact that when you fix exchange rates is you're importing the monetary policy of the anchor, as I just said. Well, that can be a disadvantage. Think of it this way. If the anchor is, for example, in an economic boom, right, and it wants to raise interest rates, what if, you're, what if the smaller country is in a recession at the time? Well, if that's the case, then the, the anchor is going to raise interest rates because it's in an economic boom. It's at the top of the cycle. The smaller country is at the bottom of the cycle, and it's going to be effectively raising its rates in a recession. That's the last thing you want to do. So you hope to have co two countries that their business cycles are relatively in sync, and it would make more sense. So if you're not in sync, the two countries are not in sync, then it doesn't make, it, it doesn't make sense to fix exchange rates. The other thing that's important, and it could be a problem, is you know if you're a smaller country and it's a weaker country, and it tries to fix, fix its exchange rate to another country, well, it, the smaller country better have a strong banking system 
and it better have sufficient international reserves to be able to support the transactions it needs to keep the currency fixed. And that's not always the case. And so what that leads us to is the idea of currency boards and dollarization. And before we get into these a little deeper, just keep in mind that with currency boards, dollarization, pegs and capital mobility, as I said earlier with some of those concepts, is that there's a continuum. And so the same thing happens here with currency boards and dollarization, there's a continuum. And basically what a currency board is on the far end, a strict currency board, is that the board in some, some form of an arrangement keeps 100% of the currency, and let's say it, it adopts dollars, it will keep in reserves dollars equal to 100% of the notes that it issues to its public in domestic currency. In other words, that the domestic currency that's circulating in a small country is backed 100% by dollars. So if people want to uh, tender their domestic currency, they'll get dollars back in return. That's a strong, hard currency board. Now, there's all sorts of variations on that, and, and it could be less than 100%, but that's basically the setup. The interesting thing about the currency board is that the domestic currency is set based on the amount of reserves that are held in its central bank or whatever arrangements, that were, whatever organization is holding the actual reserves. In that case, the money supply can't change. So if you have a country that has rampant inflation, you know, could be, for example, Argentina, then a currency board makes sense. It prevents a government com from coming in and you know, and forcing a, a central bank to basically print money, in other words, buy its debt or to issue more currency to get itself out of a, of a bad fiscal situation. Dollarization is also interesting, and again, it can be, uh, there's a continuum of dollarization. Many countries start out dollarizing, so what happens is they're, they're, their countries are in economic turmoil, there's their currency is unstable. So people begin using a dollar, for example, for transactions. And they use that because they have, they, they have some faith and confidence in the value of the dollar. It doesn't fluctuate very much. So people in, in an economy will start using dollars to transact business, and they'll start doing more and more business with that. That's called unofficial dollarization. And then it can move all the way up to, to the point where you have official dollarization. That's where the government accepts the dollar, transacts in dollars. And it's kind of like, you know, the state of Maine I was telling you about in that example of dollarization. You know, everything's conducted in the state of Maine in terms of dollars. And so we're fully dollarized. That would be one extreme situation of official dollarization. Now, before we move on, keep in mind that currency boards and dollarization, they're complex subjects. They have a long history. There's lots of experience around the world in these areas. The presentation that I'm giving is quite short. The textbook's presentation of it is quite short. It kind of gives you the idea that, oh, this is straightforward, this is easy to do, and it's just a cookie-cutter thing. It's no way in that. It's very, very complex. And the form of these arrangements depend on the country and its history. One more thing. Let's look at Central Bank Foreign Currency Liquidity Swaps. I'm talking about these now because we're in the middle of the corona crisis and the Fed put out a press release not long ago talking about how it was involved in currency swaps with other central banks around the world and they were liquidity currency swaps. So it helps alleviate pressure in for in terms of liquidity, which is why the, the, the term liquidity is there. And it's also involved in foreign currency. So let me let me motivate this swap concept first by looking at repos, because repos are sort of like a swap too. So if you recall with a repo, there was we, we couched it in terms of a dealer that needs money, right, and has a security. And then you have another dealer 
on the other side that has, we'll call it excess money, and wants to lend. Okay, so they need money, so this, this side wants to borrow, and so um, the money is going to flow in this direction, and they're going to use, this, this dealer has a security, and so it's, let's say it's a T-bill, goes in the other direction as collateral for this loan. And so this is the first part of the leg. They're called legs, okay? And so this is the first part of the transaction. And when you initiate the first part of the transaction, at the same time, you agree to unwind the transaction in the second leg. And in the second leg, which could be the next day or several days later, the money plus interest goes off to the, bar, to the lender and the collateral goes back. The T-bill goes back to, to the borrower and everything unwinds. So it's basically a purchase of a security and then a repurchase. And it's kind of almost like swapping, swapping money for the time being and with an interest rate associated with it. Well, in the currency swap market, in this type of swap market, think of it this way. You know, BMW is in the United States. And one of its largest plants in the world is in South Carolina. And it may have euro uh, liabilities. And in Europe, there could be, let's just say General Electric. General Electric could be transacting in Europe, and it could have dollar liabilities. Not just from liabilities, if I can spell it right there. And what you have here is, look, the, the BMW plant in the United States is doing most of its business in dollars, but if it has a euro liability, it comes due, and there's liquidity issues around the euro, right? What's the BMW going to do? It has to pay off this liability in euros. The same thing with General Electric. General Electric will have a liability in dollars, but it's doing most of its business over in Europe in, in euros. Where is it going to get the dollars it needs to pay off this liability? Okay. Now, this could happen not only between uh, BMW and General Electric, but a host of other companies when there's a financial crisis. So, enter the central banks. The central banks agree to swap currencies. The Fed will give, so the Fed, Fed will give the ECB dollars, and the ECB will give the Fed euros. And the Fed will end up lending the money to BMW to pay off this liability, and the ECB will give the dollars to GE to pay off its liability, and it'll facilitate liquidity. This way, BMW doesn't collapse, doesn't have an, a solvency problem. It's, you, know, you, you don't want a liquidity problem to turn into a solvency problem, and the same thing over here in General Electric. So what happens is these are central banks, foreign currency, euros and dollars, liquidity swaps. And the way they work is there's a leg, like we had here. There's a first leg, and that's basically the, the m money flowing in the first place. And then the whole thing unwinds. So this is, this is the first leg. And then the whole thing unwinds, the second leg, where the dollars go in this direction and the euros go in this way, in that direction. It could be a day or a week later, in the, but it, it returns in the short run. It unwinds in the short run. And what's interesting about these things is that the, there's no exchange rate gain or loss. The exchange rate that was used here in the first transaction is the same exchange rate used in the unwinding in the second leg of the process. And so there you have it, a little bit of current events and a little bit of financial engineering using derivatives, swap contracts.